so let's uh, let's get started with the next talk. So we have uh, the privilege of uh, of having Raluca speak. She is uh, one of the pioneers uh, of like crypto systems. Uh, she's a PhD at MIT. And now she's a faculty member here, and she'll talk about decentralized authorization frameworks for transparency. Thank you. Thank Raluca. you, Avi. And uh, nice to see you, everyone. So I'm going to tell you about Wave, which is a system for decentralized authorization from transparency logs. Can you hear me well? OK, great. All right, so this is joint work with my students, Michael and Sam, as well as, as, well as with Professor David Kaller and his students, Mustafa, Gabe, Jack, and Hill. Um, so this talk has two parts. The first, I'll tell you about transparency logs, which I think are a very interesting type of blockchain that combines the qualities of decentralized security with the performance of centralized hosting. And I find them very useful in thinking about re-architecting classical security systems with decentralized security. So an example of such a system is our platform Wave, which replaces the classical access control server where you put all your permissions and you trust it with the permissions with a decentralized authorization framework where there isn't any one server that you can attack. And this picture is from a real deployment of our WAVE system on hundreds of IoT devices, uh, which I'll describe a bit later in the talk. So transparency blog, uh, logs <laughs> are a type of blockchain that have decentralized verification and centralized hosting. So in terms of the decentralized verification, the idea is that they give some integrity guarantees that hold as long as at least one of the parties is honest. Okay? There isn't any one specific party you can attack. There's a system with multiple parties. And as long as one of them is honest, then you have integrity guarantees. At the same time, it's centrally hosted. So you can think of a big provider like Google uh, hosting this log. And because of this, it has really high throughput, really good performance. You don't have to worry about proof of work. You don't have to worry about duplicating the whole system state of all these participants in the network. You don't even have to worry about Byzantine consensus. So it's very fast. But the whole point is that it's checked, it's verified in a decentralized manner. Okay? So you trust them with availability, the Google, for example, but you don't trust with the integrity guarantees. So because you trust Google with availability, obviously Google can den denial of service the, the log, right? So if Google wants, they won't provide service. So this, for example, wouldn't be fit for a cryptocurrency because you can't just have your money disappear. Um, but if you think about using this for hosting certificates or access permissions, then maybe it's not such a big problem because if Google denies service, then really there are bigger problems happening. Okay. And moreover, this can also be uh, and it is currently distributed across multiple big providers. So as long as one of them is available, then you're fine. OK, so I'm not really concerned about this uh, downside, at least for the kind of use cases we are envisioning. All right, so one very famous example of transparency logs. Yeah, question. Is there the same properties that uh, you don't want, like censorship or, I mean, there's a like live, liveness in the sense that any honest node could add to the log? and. Uh, yes, so we'll see in a moment. So uh, Google is uh, the one who it gives availability, right? So any node can send entries and Google can add them. If Google decides not to add them, it won't add them. But Google won't be able to equivocate. So we'll see in a moment what a guarantee actually gives you. Won't be able to show you two different histories to two different people, okay? But it can choose to not include an entry in the log if it wants to. Okay, so how many of you here know how certificate transparency works? OK, one person. That's great. Two people. OK, great. So um, I'm going to explain how it works. And I think it's very, very interesting. So it's essentially a type of blockchain used for storing certificates, like web certificates. And it addresses a 20-year-old problem with certificate authorities. What's the problem? Well, that CS can be compromised and issue fake certificates. Okay. So there's so many examples of that, including prominent ones like Verizon, which is you know, one of the authorities in the certificate space, issued false Microsoft certificates. Okay? And the fundamental problem is that you can't tell if a certificate is good or bad. You can't tell if it was produced by a party while being compromised or not. Okay, so it's a really, really tough problem. And people, yeah. Going backward, can you define what you mean by the word certificate precisely? Okay, so. Um, 
What I mean by certificates, I refer to the web certificates, where, for example, um, when you go to a website, right, TLS uses certificates to authenticate that indeed you're talking to the host you think you're talking to. So it basically is a signature that binds a host name with a public key. So then you can use it for a you know, secure uh, communication and you establish key exchange. And so these are integral, the certificates are integral to communicating on the web. Whenever you have TLS and SSL and you have the green lock, then you're using certificates. And the question is, are those certific certificates trustworthy or not? Okay, because if they're compromised, then you think you're talking to Bank of America, but you're actually talking to an attacker. So in this case, because Microsoft certificates were compromised, then users were going to some attacker site thinking it's actually Microsoft when it wasn't. And so yeah, there has been really a long-standing problem with many, many attempts at solutions, but fundamentally the problem remained that you can't really tell if a certificate is compromised or not. So certificate transparency is a real system. It's actually used all the time. You are using it in your Chrome browser. So every certificate that you use in your Chrome browser has been validated by CT. Okay? Chrome does not accept certificates that have not been validated by CT. Okay? So this is a very real deployment scenario. What is a fake certificate? A fake certificate. When I go to the website. Yeah. Do I really know uh, what is the public key of this website? The, the, I, I want to talk to, to some website. Do I know the public key of the, of the website I want to talk to? Yeah, so here's uh, what the certificate is. So it, it's basically a signature. Let's say you want to talk to Bank of America. It's a signature from an authority like Verizon saying that Bank of America's public key is this. Okay? And your browser trusts Verizon because it has Verizon's public key hard-coded in the browser, okay? So that's why you believe that, that's a t you really believe that that is the public key of Bank of America and you start doing key exchange and secure, transferring secure information, okay? A fake certificate is when Verizon was compromised and tricked to sign for Bank of America a wrong public key, the public key of an attacker. That's a fake certificate, okay? Uh, okay, so let me tell you a bit of how a certificate transparency works. Um, and our system will be building on it later. So it has essentially two types of parties, the log server that stores the log of certificates and then some monitors and auditors that are checking the integrity of the log server, namely that it does not equivocate. And I'm gonna conflate the monitors and auditors together, let's just call them auditors. It's not that important, the distinction. All right, so here's the guarantee that uh, certificate transparency tries to give at the high level. That everyone sees the same append-only log of certificates if at least one auditor is not compromised. Okay, so everyone will see the same history, the same log of certificates. Everyone in the world, or, or, not, or not have service from Google. I mean, they can also be denied responses, of course, but if they see something, they're all gonna see the same log of certificates, yeah. This is for, there are multiple blogs, so this is a guarantee for each particular Yes, blog. yes, this is a, exactly. There can be multiple providers each, you know, providing their log. Let's just focus on just one provider in the whole talk. Just look at one, the situation repeats for the others. Yeah. So you have this log provider that's storing the log, and then you're going to have these auditor parties that are going to verify that the log provider does not equivocate, namely does not provide two different logs to different people. So here is why this is great and why this you know, addresses the certificate, the fake certificate problem. So Bank of America, um, you know, can, can register one of these certificates, can put them in the log for Bank of America. And then it can keep watching the log to see what are all the different certificates added to it. Okay, if it sees, okay, so it's gonna check every single certificate appended to the log to make sure if it's for Bank of America, then it's really provided by Bank of America, okay? So it's monitoring its own certificates. Why? Because if there's a compromised certificate authority that produces a fake certificate for Bank of America and appends it, appends it into the log, then Bank of America is going to see it, okay? It's going to see it immediately and take action, okay? So the point is that what's really great fundamentally about CT is that you won't be able to, a user will never be able to tell if a certificate is good or not. But they know that Bank of America would have seen it, okay, if it's bad. Okay, so as soon as someone registers a fake certificate for Bank of America on the log, then Bank of America sees it, catches it, and can take action. And that action is outside of 
city. Okay? So now, if a student fetches a Bank of America certificate from the log, well, they, they, again, they don't know if it's correct or not. Okay? That's, a, that's a very difficult question to answer. But they know that Bank of America saw it as well and is fine with it. Okay? So implicitly, it means that it's, it's, a, it's a good certificate for Bank of America. Okay? So I think this is the, kind of the genius in this proposal. It's not that it's trying to, to verify whether a certificate is valid or not. It's just transparency in that you know that Bank of America is seeing the same certificate for Bank of America and they're okay with it. Does, does the idea make sense? Okay. So, yeah, question. There's an initial trust to establish this, right? So someone needs to say this is Bank of America's public key that he can, or Bank of America can authenticate the logs. So there is, there needs to be... Yes, you have to assume that Bank of America is monitoring the logs. Logs and also the log provider knows who the Bank of America is and Bank of America's public key. No, no. Not necessarily. Not, not necessarily. So it's true that the log provider has to kind of do some cleaning. Bef I mean, it doesn't, can't just let everyone to put certificates for Bank of America. It just creates like a, some you know, junk there. But the point is that Bank of America can see everything that's there, right? And they can take action if there's a fake certificate recorded for Bank of America. Okay. Sure. So you don't have to trust. Do you need to say that every time there's an update, oh, this is fake, this is soft Bank of America. Don't you need to know? who Bank of America is? Yeah, so there is definitely that a little bit of verification that the log is doing, but it doesn't have to be trusted. Because here's what happens. So the, this um, log provider can filter out attempts to append a certificate, right? Saying, okay, your Bank of America, this looks reasonable. Why? Because um, in, if, if they allow a fake certificate to be added, then there's all this, then Bank of America will detect it, right? And they have to take some much more complicated actions to clean that up. But you don't have to trust the um, log provider. It is very convenient, though, for them to check. OK, does it make sense? What's the difference between, let's say, DNS? Mm -hmm. DNS takes a string of words mm -hmm. and associates an IP address. OK? Mm -hmm. Is a certificate authority is essentially association between Bank of America and public key, only that instead of DNS, uh, we, have, uh, we have some um, very site that says, okay, Bank of America, this is the public key. Once I have a public key, we can authenticate and everything. But it's association between public key and the name of Bank of America. Is this... Uh, so the certificate, the certificate authority. The certificate tries, it's a signature, right? Tries to be certified by some authority like Verizon, the binding. Okay, so it's not just the binding like DNS. It actually tries to certify the binding. Okay? And ultimately, yes, you, you, you do, so your browser will probably look for certain CAs into the log, right, that is trusted, trust very design, maybe a few other CAs. But ultimately, if a fake certificate makes it into the log for Bank of America, the Bank of America will detect it. Okay, that's the guarantee that the certificate transparency provides. Okay? Yeah, I know you said it was outside of the system, but I'm just curious. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I exactly. So if someone manages to somehow append a fake certificate and then Bank of America will detect it, what do they do? It will stay in the log. It's, it's, you can issue revocation lists in the browser. You can issue all kinds of sort of things. You can contact that person. You can take legal action, you know, but it's still going to stay in the log. Okay, so it's, it's complicated. What's preventing me to launch a denial of service attack and say that this is fake, this is fake all the time? So I assume I'm not Bank of America, but I want to, to prevent Bank of, of America to be updated. Mm -hmm. So you are saying that you don't need to know the bank, public key of Bank of America. So I can, can I claim to be Bank of America and deny all the updates to its new uh, public key? So when Bank of America finds a, a fake certificate, they can take out of bound action like a legal action, right? And, and you know, in legal action, you prove that yourself in whatever way. Mm -hmm. Assume there is a real, real certificate put on the loan yeah. by someone, and I, I'm, I'm claiming to a bank of America, and I say it's fake. Mm -hmm. So it's you can't just say it's fake. You, you, you can't just ha say it's fake. You have to prove. You know, you have to prove who you are. You have to so do all this authentication. There's already a way. There's already an authentication procedure for obtaining certificates in the first place, right? So that exists. But sometimes it gets subverted through social engineering. So now what we're just saying is like, okay, like 
if that gets subverted, we now at least we'll find out about it so we can go through the same thing, maybe slightly more rigorous, and like, you know, complain about it and then do something about it. And do something legally about it. But again, I just want to say this is outside of the city system, and I'm actually not really interested in that at all. Uh, what I'm interested in is the guarantee that if there's a fake certificate there, Bank of America will find it, will see it. Okay, that's the only property I'm interested in. The rest, there's so many politics out there. What's the legal procedure? What do you do? What not? I'm really not interested in that. Okay? They're great questions, but... No. On an abstract level, it sounds to me you're talking that uh, a certificate is about binding. Mm -hmm. DNS is also about binding. So if there is a difference, try to explain to me why you are going, why, for example, your solution will not be a good solution for DNS, for example binding a name of a Bank of America with an IP address, for in, in, in principle, no, it's in principle, it can be a good... So the thing is that you don't really need that security for DNS, because the TLS and the certificates are at a higher level. So you don't really need that for DNS. For DNS, is literally a network function where you just look up a, pub, uh, you look up a public key, right? So you don't need a cryptographic binding based on trust and based on you know, people you trust like you need for certificates. DNS is literally a systems function where you're looking up a, a, you know, some IP address, right? Uh, and, and that's it, you know? And then you have TLS on top at a, at a, at a higher level. You can add, you can add, of course, yeah. Same way on that blockchain. Yeah, you can do, do that if you want. Uh, the, you, you can do that if you want, but you're kind of... Re I, I have a question. That. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's. I agree. Let, let's continue. To any key value type of binding, but yes. why don't we let her get on to that? Exactly. Sure. All right. So um, okay. So we discuss this. All right. So now the question is. Uh, okay. So now let's see, let's see how the data structure looks like. Okay. And the data structure is actually very simple. It's a Merkle hash tree, right? So you take the certificates and you just uh, log them based on time. Right, so for example, certificate three was just added in the last uh, epoch, and then you just build the Merkle hash root on top of it, okay? Um, so it's just, A is just the hash of certificate zero, E is the hash of A and B, and then the Merkle hash root is the hash of ENF, so it captures the whole tree. You should already know how Merkle trees work, okay. Um, so how does auditing work? Well, <clears throat> the log provider is going to send in every epoch a signature of the Merkle hash root with epoch number to the auditors. Now the auditors are going to start gossiping amongst each other to make sure they're all getting the same signature in every epoch, okay? If they're getting two different signatures in the same epoch, the log provider is equivocating and is thrown away from the system forever. Now there's more that they have to do. They have to check that uh, the append only property is satisfied. So uh, what they're gonna do is in uh, epoch I plus one, it's going to ask the log provider to, pro to give the appended certificates, let's say that these were appended in epoch I plus one, and it's going to check that the append property, how? Well, it's gonna take the old log um, root, which was this, and then it's going to hash this and hash together to obtain the new log root, okay? So that's how it's gonna check that this log was only appended, okay? All right, and there's another uh, proof, it's the audit proof in which you can check that the certificate was indeed included in this log, okay? So that's very simple, you just do a Merkle. So for example, if I want to check the certificate three is included in the log, I'm just going to you know, ask from the log provider C, right? And I'm gonna ask E, and then I can hash things together again and check against the Merkle root, yeah. How did you check that it's uh, append only? Like, are, are the leaves basically the, the blocks that you just... Yeah, so how, here's, here's how you check that it's append only. So in epoch i, let's say this was what you had in epoch i, this was your log, and this was the Merkle hash root, and you had a signature on it. In epoch i plus one, this is the new Merkle hash root because you appended this. The way you check it's append only, you make sure that things were added only on the right. How? You're asking the server for the hashes of things that were added on the right, and you're hashing them together with the previous root, on the right, and making sure you get the new root. So, okay, but so, so the communication overhead of checking. Yes, the yes. The size of the increments. Yes, absolutely. The communication um, overhead, yes, it's indeed the size of the increments, linear in the amount of items added, and logarithmic in the size of the tree. Okay. 
And then uh, this is how you check that uh, the certificate is in the log. You just ask for the Merkle hash root. Yeah, question? Provide all the new items, like like in the case you added two items, you can provide. The yes, absolutely. I completely agree with you. Absolutely agree with you. Yeah, in in this case where you added these two values, you just need to provide this hash. Completely agree. Uh, but uh, there are worse cases in which you actually end up kind of providing more of them. Yes, but it should be logarithmic. It should still be logarithmic. Yes. Why wouldn't it just be the next child uh, or? Uh, so um, no, I'm not. Constant, definitely logarithmic in the path, in the length of the path, well, if you right? The tree, like, the tree doesn't have to be balanced, right? It can always just be what the previous one plus whatever you add. Well, you want it to be balanced so that uh, oh, the so proof, so that audit proof and the paths don't grow too much. Yeah, yeah. So you can do logarithmic. Now, the reason it's linear, um, so the monitors do end up getting all of these because they want to check if there's a Bank of America certificate that ha had appeared. So yes, but I, I agree just for the sole purpose of this proof, it can be logarithmic. Great questions. All right. So here's how um, you uh, implement them I in the Bank of America example uh, with you know using the capabilities of CT underneath. So Bank of America is going to be this auditor and monitor that's going to constantly get the appended value always and look at them. Is there a fake certificate for Bank of America added? And it's going to check the proof of append the append. So it's going to do this proof of consistency. And so if a compromise CA anytime appends a fake certificate, then um, then Bank of America is going to notice it, right? It's going to see it. At the same time, a user, uh, when they go to, you know, when they fetch a certificate uh, for Bank of America, they're going to do the audit proof and make sure that indeed this uh, certificate is in the current Merkle hash root signed by the provider, you know, and it gets that signature from the, for many auditors, right, to make sure that there isn't an equivocation about that signature. Okay. So this is how it works. Um, any quick question before I go to more interesting things? So, so browsers basically, when they, they'll basically query this on the cert, like no, they wouldn't know the node in which to query, right? Yeah. Or There's a bit more complication in the system. Sometimes you get proofs of um, merging. So, well, let's ignore them. In the simplified form, they're going to basically ask for a certificate from, they're going to basically get a certificate from Bank of America when they visit it. You visit Bank of America normally, you get a certificate. And you need to check it's in the CT log, so you're just going to ask for the audit proof for it. But, but that it's also the latest one in the log, right? You're going to check it against, um, no, well... How do you know there isn't a future one that was added after? You don't? Yeah. You don't really check that because uh, you make sure that, you know, if there's a bad certificate, if some bad certificate was issued, there's other mechanism that can, that can be used to... You're allowed to have multiple certs in the log same time and websites do this because they have different colors. Yeah. yeah, so as long as the certificate is not expired, right, and it's in the log, then you're, ha you're happy. So, 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 and you also need a regular schedule for the, for the growth of the, uh, of the log? If there's a schedule for? Uh, I, I, I could do an attack based on uh, uh, doing a denial of service around the target uh, and just feeding them an old log. No, because that's the whole point that you prevent equivocation with CT. The, the point is that you prevent equivocation because um, the log provider published the signature of the Merkle root in every epoch, and everyone makes sure it's consistent. So the attacker uh, just feeds to the, um, uh, I mean, I, I mean, there's, uh, there's further sort of uh, online sort of uh, activity happening. The attacker is feeding to the browser uh, an old log information. Okay, there may have been an update to the log that says, okay, here's this certificate has been invalidated. I see, and can, and can denial service to the user. I mean, there's some checks that they probably do, like the epoch number should be kind of recent within the current time. I'm sure they do some of these checks. But that's what I'm suggesting. That yeah. Is an assumed path. They probably do that. But you know what the attacker cannot do is it cannot trick the user in accepting a certificate that is not in city. That's what the attacker cannot do, and that's the important property. Not doing revocation, so... All right, actually, we will get to the location soon, so just have a little bit of patience. Okay, so then, uh, so in summary, it offers transparency with decentralized verification and high throughput, right? Because this is super simple operation. And the high throughput is what's really cool if you want to re-architect, you know, classical security systems in a decentralized way. So speaking of that, uh, our system wave is such an example. So uh, in WAVE, we want to replace servers that store access control and permissions. Uh, we want them to be enforced cryptographically, so you don't have to trust any one server. 
So we are going to store the permissions in a new transparency log, and I'll explain why we need a new one. And the goal, the ambitious goal is to replace mainstream authorization systems like Active Directory auth, things like this. They shouldn't, you shouldn't have to trust a server to, with your permissions, right? The server could delete the permissions, could insert new permissions, could see the permissions. So here is an example, a motivating example, um, why traditional authorization access control is not great. And I really like the IoT use case because I think it's pretty, pretty clear. So consider you have a building owner that has many buildings and he uh, gives access to the tenant company CEO to just the floor three, their startup company on floor three. And then this tenant gives access to its employees, so I know to the heating system, lights, doors, locks, so forth. With the traditional approach, you have, um, you know, you have a centralized server that stores all these permissions. What are problems with that? Well, first, it's a central point of attack, right? An attacker can compromise it, can change permissions, can read them. Second, it's actually really not clear who should store the server because we are having multiple trust domains here. There's the trust domain of the building owner, which delegates to his, you know, the companies that rent from him. And then there's the trust domain within the company, okay, which delegates to the employees. So if you put the server, the permission server, the building owner, then the building owner is going to see all these delegations within the tenant company, and they're not supposed to see that. If you put this server instead of the tenant CEO, right, to store it, then the tenant CEO will see what, you know, to what other companies the building owner is delegating. And so there isn't really even a natural place to, uh, to put a server like this when you span multiple domains. Okay? And some systems also lack transitive delegation. Um, basically what that means is that a tenant can on its own delegate a subset of the permissions. Okay, so these are some traditional systems for access control that are pretty famous and that, and that provide transitive delegation. The main problem they have is that they don't, they, they have a central authority that they trust, they trust the server to store this, you know, to store permission information. And second is that they actually get to see, to see permissions, right? So that server would see what the permissions are and they are very, they can be very private, right? It's really fine grained about what you have access to where you live and what floor you work on and so forth. So in comparison, our system WAVE uh, avoids central uh, authority and protects permissions in, the public, in a public transparency log while also providing transitive delegation. So to make this happen, there's actually a number of challenges. Uh, first is what kind of blockchain do we need to store the permissions? Well, it turns out that classical blockchains like Ethereum are not scalable enough. And um, transparency logs like certificate transparency, as you already discovered, don't support evocation. So we came up with a new transparency log called the ULDM transparency log, which I will describe. Uh, and then the question is, okay, so now you're putting permissions on a public blockchain and everyone can see them. Okay, so how can we encrypt them? And it turns out to be very difficult to, uh, you can't just use public key encryption because it's too coarse grained. Okay. People are supposed to delegate things and then delegate to others and others and others. When you give access to someone, you don't know to whom they're going to delegate and what they're going to delegate. Okay, so we have a protocol called reverse discoverable encryption, which allows us to encrypt the permissions but have people be able to discover their, the permissions that are relevant to them, but not discover permissions relevant to others. <coughs> All right, so in the rest of the talk, I will uh, focus on mostly on the transparency log in interest of time, but to understand how it works, I'm just going to introduce uh, some background uh, on just how our you know, authorization model works. Okay, so first a bit of background and then we're going to talk about the transparency log and at a high level how the encryption works. So we represent access <coughs> control as a graph, okay, which is a model that already existed in, from 96. Salty and spooky, so it's a graph instead of an access control list table because the graph naturally represents a transitive delegation, right? So who gave access to what and, and so forth. So we have entities, uh, participants in the system that are identified by public keys exactly like in a cryptocurrency. So this is a very, it's like a <coughs> similar situation. 
<coughs> and then we grant permissions. So edges represent permissions. And we grant permissions by signing okay, that the permission was, act, was granted similarly to when you pay, when you make a transaction in a, in a cryptocurrency. Okay? So for example, here, the building owner is signing that he's giving access to floor three to the CEO. And there's going to be other stuff uh, that's important in signature Okay? And then the CEO is going to sign that they give access to the heating system to employee one. Okay, so in this sense, it parallels the cryptocurrency trans transactions. Now, how does an employee prove to the door lock that he has permission to it? Well, the proof is a path, okay? Is this path from the owner of the door, which is the building owner, <coughs> for which you can assume that the door has the public key hard-coded, right? It's this path of signatures, okay? And it gives access to what? To the intersection of the resources, okay? So this path of signatures gives access to the doors on floor three, okay, to the employee. It doesn't give access to all of floor three, it's an intersection, right? Okay, so that's pretty simple. And so this forms a global graph where you can put everyone's Imagine everyone's permissions as a global graph, and you can have many different owners, so it's decentralized because you know, every single owner with their own resources are, you know, have some resources in this graph, and other owners have other resources, so it's really decentralized based on how people own things. Okay, and it's important that different participants will only see portions of the graph. Okay. Is the graph model clear? All right, great. So now that we understood the graph model, I can explain uh, how we actually store this graph and what we need from a transparency log to be able to store a graph like this and, and manipulate a graph like this. And then I'm going to explain a very, very high level how we do this reverse discoverable encryption. Okay, so our transparency log um, is called ULDM, which stands for unequivocable log derived map. I will explain the name. And it's meant to store encrypted permissions for now, assume they're not going to be encrypted. We're going to encrypt them later. And the revocations, okay? And, but I want to say that it's really applicable beyond storing permissions. We are extending certificate transparency with revocation, so it's, it's useful for you know, any scenarios where you want these basic properties. All right. So first, what do we need from this log? Okay? Well, decentralized security as before. We want to, what I mean by that is the same thing that, uh, you know, the, the log provider cannot equivocate, okay? So you don't have to trust any one server for that. Immutability and append only again. Then we also need efficient proofs of existence, okay? So we efficiently check that something exists, like a permission exists in the, in the log. But then I also want efficient proofs of non-existence. Any ideas why? Why do I want efficient proofs of non-existence? Yeah. Exactly, exactly. You want to prove that you haven't been revoked, right? So, you, you, I mean, you, could pr you can also prove you were revoked. It's just not very, you know, but you want to prove you weren't revoked when you access for, when you want some, to use some resource. Yeah. And I still want to high performance, right? I don't want to make this thing slower. So, okay, so, yeah. Why do you need the append only? in this context of uh, authorizations? Is it, isn't the current state the best, like, enough? So I definitely don't want uh, permissions to be thrown away and discarded, right? And that's, that's one easy way to make sure that wasn't the case, that nothing was discarded. But the thrown away, discarded is like user error, right? Like, uh, it No, I want to make sure that the log provider is not deleting my access or something. Or is not deleting a revocation because they're colluding with the revoked user. Yeah. Oh, I'll into this. Yeah. So actually, uh, yeah. Anyways, initially we we're looking at using an earlier system, but you know it, it has many issues. Uh, like so, we're using a classical blockchain, but it has many issues. Um, it, it's yeah. You you can in principle implement all the security aspects, but it's not efficient and you know not scalable. Um, then you can think of certificate transparency, but certificate transparency does not have efficient proof of non-existence. And if you think about it, 
it is a little bit at odds with the immutability and append-only property, right? Because if I want to show it's append-only and then I append based on time, but then how am I going to efficiently show that the value doesn't exist? Right? To efficiently show that the value doesn't exist, I kind of need a data structure sorted by value. Okay. So our ULDM data structure reconciles this property and offers efficient proofs of non-existence on top of the properties of certificate transparency. So what's the insight? Well, the insight is kind of what the name says. We are going to derive a map from a log. So the map is going to be used to prove non-existence or existence, right? Because maps are dictionaries and you can map based on value. So you can usually think of it as a tree and you can easily check if the value is in there or not. And we're going to derive them from a log, which we're going to use to prove the append only. Property. Okay. In terms of overall parties, it's very similar to certificate transparency. We have a log provider storing the log. We have clients that can append or read. And we have auditors that verify. Okay. So now let's see how the data structure at the log provider looks like. The first part is like in certificate transparency. We have an operation log uh, where we log operations in, um, you know, as, as they show up to the right, append only. Each operation is going to be a key and a value pair. And they're always going to be appended on the right, like in certificate transparency. So this uh, log grows uh, by time and is sorted by time. So it's exactly city here. Now, here's where the differences come in. We have actually three layers of data structures. So what happens is that we also maintain an object map. The object map is key to value, OK? It's actually sorted based on uh, the hash of the key. Okay, it's sorted based on the hash of the key. And it contains all the keys in the system. So the, two ma the map and the log, they both contain the same data values, just sorted differently. And whenever you, you know, if an epoch I, let's say you append these values, then you're going to have to insert them in the, um, in the object map. And then we take the root of the object map and keep it in a hash chain, like, like a blockchain. Okay, so basically what we have in uh, each um, block is we have the hashes for an epoch. And so, for example, here, you can see my mouse. Okay, it's okay. So here we just have, you know, the epoch number, then the hash of the previous, because this is the hash chain. And we have a hash of the object map root and the hash of the operation log root. Okay, so we have the hashes of the two trees. In the, in the hash chain, okay? And this is what the log provider is going to sign and give to auditors, okay? So it's going to, when the log provider provides one of these signatures in an epoch, it took a snapshot of the state of the operation log and object map, okay? And it includes the hash of the previous um, block, so it includes the whole history of the snapshots of the two logs, okay? So one single signature has that whole history of all the state of the two trees in every single epoch. So what do the auditors do? First, they need to check they're getting the same signature. Because, uh, you know, in an epoch, you should only get one signature from the log provider. The log provider should not equivocate and provide different ones. But then it also has to check that the operation log and the object map are computed correctly. So for the object log, for the operation log, it's just going to check append only the same way as for certificate transparency. Okay, same thing. But then it's going to take those appended items and insert them into the object map. Well, actually, it's going to ask the server to, for proof that they were inserted in the correct way. Okay, so how, how do you do that? Well, for every single value that was appended, you ask the server for a Merkle uh, hash proof that it was inserted in the correct place. And remember that things are sorted by the hash. So you can tell what's the correct place. How? Let's say I have to insert the key between uh, 0 and 1. Okay? I'm going to first tell the server, OK, I need to insert this key. So tell me the proof of the enclosing range. Okay? What is the tightest enclosing range? Show to me they are in the tree. Prove to me they are in the tree by using a regular Merkle proof okay? against the root of the pre from the previous epoch. Once you establish this is the correct range, you, you basically do the insert in here, okay? And then you recompute the whole Merkle hash to check is the one from the new epoch. 
Okay. This is a very high level because there's a ton of technicality. Yeah. Yeah, you can do rotations by always proving them with the Merkle root, against the Merkle root. Um, so you do linear work in every single appended operation, yes. The server does that work, and then the auditors have to prove just the Merkle roots. <coughs> has to prove the, have to check the Merkle paths, yeah. And the rehashing is not bottleneck. The rehashing is, is not, I mean, it's not a bottleneck for us. I mean, it's definitely more scalable than a regular blockchain, for example. And the nice thing is that um, you don't work with the actual, so the auditors never work with the actual data, they just work with the hashes. And checking, you can check so many hashes, you can check a lot of hashes. But if I were to ask, if you were to ask me what is, you know, if you increase and increase and increase and increase scale, at what point, which is the point that would become first the heaviest, I would say it's the, the this part uh, for the auditors. Purge expired certificates or, or expired operations? So this just but it's a pend only, so you it's don't? A, it's a pend only, yeah, you don't. They just expire, so they're not useful. But it's a very good point, you know, because if, if you worry about the scale, right, then well, the scale just grows logarithmically, but sure, it grows forever. Yeah. Well, no, but the, sorry, it's not because the object, or you purge them from the object map, because otherwise the object map is going to grow. Yeah, but, but yes, but, yes but, but the depth, the depth only grows logarithmically. And but all the Merkle proofs. The whole thing is going to grow linearly. Oh, but I'm not rehashing the whole thing. I'm never rehashing the whole thing. So this is a lot of technicality in how you do this kind of Merkle updates. I'm never rehashing the whole thing. So let's say I just inserted something in here, OK? Uh, this, this is a binary search tree. Maybe it caused a small local rotation, OK? But the amount of items I touched is logarithmic by the guarantees of the binary search tree. But don't I have to push, like, for example, in that example, doesn't K1 now have to move to like the other side of the tree? So imagine an AVL tree let's say, or something, or a binary search tree, right? You're gonna, you might gonna have to, when you put something in here, you might gonna have to do uh, like rotation. This is balanced, but it's not perfectly balanced, right? It's not perfect, it's balanced, but not perfectly. Like you can have a, leg a, a level twice as large as the other, but not that much. It's balanced, not perfectly, but it's deterministic. So everybody's doing Absolutely, the same exactly, yeah. So you can have some um, leaves, you know, some, some subtrees a little bit unbalanced, but it's still balanced within a factor. So it's like an AVL tree or a red black tree. They're all balanced trees and deterministic trees. Yeah. But if it were perfect to be like this, I agree. It would be hash. Okay. So, yeah. So far, how does this compare to the extended certificate transparency paper? Um, which is that the VLBM or which, which one do you mean? I think there's a paper called extended certificate transparency that had the same, like uh, you have a log of operations and then you have a, a Tree that's so there is a there is a very short like um, so if if it, the one you refer to there's a very short um, like a sketch somewhere I think there was on a Twitter Twitter <laughs> post and it wasn't clear how they do it wasn't clear how they do um, the auditing they didn't even describe it it wasn't clear how they do the um, also the batching and the merge promises and all of this so there are many things that weren't clear that we looked at the implementation, it wasn't really clear. There was definitely a sketch of an attempt of doing this, but it's not an actual paper, so we looked at it, we can't really understand. The source code doesn't really have it. So we have maybe an academic approach trying to do the same thing. Okay. All right, so now we can see uh, how you can prove existence, right? So you can prove existence easily against this object map, right? Because um, I can, if I want to check that uh, value is in the Merkle uh, tree for the object map, I just tell the server, hey, give me the, you know, give me the authentication path, and I can check it. Um, you can also see how I can prove non-existence, okay? And the way I prove non-existence is I tell the server, hey, um, prove to me that this value doesn't exist, and the server has to give you, again, the most enclosing interval for where that value would have gone in, okay? and give you the Merkle path that you can check against the current signature. But know that you can also check where these values are in the tree. Why? Because the paths are like left, right, right, you know? So you can tell that two values really come after each other in the Merkle tree, okay? So you can really check that nothing is in the middle between them. Is it clear? I mean, 
it's, it takes a bit of uh, just a bit of technicality with Merkle trees, but the point is that you can check that there's nothing in there. So you only need the object map for the proof of non-existence. The existence you can use the operation log from. Um, yes, but e even then, even then it might be less efficient because let's say I appended a million values in the last epoch, then I have to scan those million values to check existence. Right? So it's not going to be logarithmic guaranteed uh, for the proof of existence. No, I mean, can't you just point to some node and show the, the path from that operation to the... Oh, oh, oh sorry, 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 yes, absolutely, yes. It's like in certificate transparency, yes, yes. Uh, you're right. Uh, yeah, exactly like certificate transparency. You can approve uh, existence here as well, yeah. Is it that the object map, though, like if, for example, I have a million operations on the same K0, the object map actually only has one K0, the latest K0, or are no, they we actually... we include everything. Sorry? We include everything. We, we don't lose anything, yeah. Yeah, and definitely, our, I mean, as I said, our main contribution top of city is the proof of non-existence. Mm. Okay. All right. At a very high level, again, I'm trying to understand. You have a log. Uh -huh. The log is a log. Uh -huh. Okay. In the log, there is a certificate that says, I authorize you. And you authorize the, some others, and there is a whole tree behind you mm -hmm. of authorization. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then I revoke. Mm -hmm. There is now a lot of things that we need to revoke to other. Let's talk about revocation right now. All this is sitting in a, in, in a line in the, in the log. In the log, it's a line. Mm -hmm. It's like union fine. This is union fine. Okay. Now I go and I have a Merkle tree. And I want to think of a Merkle tree as a 2 3 tree or whatever that I want to. All these things will sit in a, in a Merkle tree, but in some order that I can, I can now hash them and get and, and mm -hmm. find them. Yeah. Okay. Now, when I de authorize you, Somehow, somebody, where, how do we go now to the Merkle tree and we essentially eliminate exactly. all the things that they Absolutely. Let's talk about revocation right now. This is the next step. Talking about revocation. So this, okay, this is what this ledger can do, this transparency law can do pretty well, is revoc revocation. So let me show, let's, let's take this concrete example. The CEO gave access to Alice to the lock, okay? And now Alice wants to go to the lock and say, hey, I have access. Because the CEO, look, I have this signature from the CEO, I have access, so let me un unlock, unlock you. But then the lock says, what if you were revoked? You know, you need to prove to me that you were not revoked. And it's, so how does the lock know that the Alice, Alice's access was not revoked in the meantime? And it's actually not as simple as just throwing a proof of non-existence. It's a little bit tricky. Okay, so let's look at it. Obviously, you don't want to scan the lock, that's too much work. So let's try to use proof of non-existence. It's a little bit tricky. So. First attempt, the CEO can append to the log this operation, revoke sig, okay, so revoke this signature, append it into the transparency log, okay, and then Alice provides a proof that this revocation, so provides a proof to the log that the revocation revoke for this signature does not exist in the transparency log, okay, uses a proof of non existence, okay, and then the, the log can say, okay, the CEO clearly didn't revoke it. It's convinced of that. But what is, what is the problem, though? There's a problem here. Can someone say it? What do you mean? Alice provides proof. That it, we want now to prevent that she will provide proof. She cannot. She shouldn't be able to provide proof because there is a revoke in the... In the no, she provides a proof that the rev Okay. So uh, let me explain this properly. Okay, let, let me explain this again. So the CEO can... If the CEO wants to revoke... Right, you can append revoke and signature to the log, okay? Right. Now, as if the CEO did not revoke Alice, then she can prove the non-existence of this binding, okay, to the log. She can always give an old proof, like before the revoke was there, but are you assuming the log can always get the latest? <laughs> no, so no, the log has the latest epoch number and the latest signature. Okay, let's assume that, that's a great point. Let, let, that's implicit, let's assume that the log has the log has the latest signature, right, uh, for the current epoch. And let's assume that the CEO did not revoke Alice. He actually did not revoke Alice, so she is able to provide 
a proof that revocation does not exist using the proof of non-existence. This is, this is all fine. The security is, is, is fine here in terms of her, you know, revocation being uh, observed by the lock or not. But there's some other problem, yeah. The revocation, yes, let's make it unique. You know what we're going to do? We're going to take exactly this signature, and all we're going to do is going to put the word revoke in front of it, and the signature, I'm going to throw that in a transparency log. Yeah. The CEO can have his permission to revoke. Yeah. Yeah, so not just the CEO in general. Anyone can revoke any permission, right? Because all that it takes, all that it takes to revoke someone's permission is to throw, put in the transparency log a message, revoke comma that permission. Right? Anyone can do it. There's no authentication here at the signature that the CEO actually intended to revoke this. Yeah. Are the signatures malleable? Um, so this is a signature from, so this is the original permission. And all that the CEO does is it adds revoke and the signature in a transparency log. There's no, it doesn't, in this scheme it doesn't sign it. But, I told but if I can submit my permit, if I can, use malleability to grant myself permission twice, maybe only one of them will get revoked. No, there's no malleability here. This, this is a regular uh, signature, uh, existentially unforgeable. Yeah. But I thought auditor prevents the inclusion of wrong statements. There was auditor checking the inclusions and so on into the law. Okay, so the, fine. That, that, that's in certificate transparency, but <laughs> in here, how would the auditor know whether some permission is accepted or not, right? Yeah? Sorry, it is obvious, but... Can the CEO modify the authorization? Meaning you uh -huh. can enter yeah. the apartment, but within uh, two hours, not before. So it changes mind. Um, sure, I mean, the CEO can grant you permissions for anything that he has access to. But let me clarify this like this. So this, this was a silly straw man in which all I, it takes to revoke someone is to say revoke with the, with the permission that they had, OK? So this is obviously anyone can just take someone's permission and say revoke and then revoke them, right? So there's no, this is silly. So let's just fix this in a very straightforward way that, yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe I sh I'll fix the slides to make that more clear. The SIG was just the original SIG, okay? Maybe I'll just give it a notation. It was just the original SIG and you revoke the original SIG. I'll make, I'll make, I'll make the slides more clear. But it's, it's still helpful, the straw man is helpful because it was working in, in terms of if you were revoked, then the law couldn't give you access. Okay? But you could be denial of service by someone. Okay, so this one, here's what happens with this one. The CEO signs, okay, this, um, this permission when, uh, signs this revocation when he puts it in the log. But there's a really a problem here. So Alice goes to the log and she says, hey, I have access. And the log says, prove to me that this wasn't revoked. How can she possibly do that? What does she give a signature of non-existence for? Because <coughs> this doesn't exist, right? So if she wasn't revoked, if she wasn't revoked by the CEO, this signature was never put in the log. She doesn't know what this signature is. It's unforgeable. So she cannot give a proof of non-existence for something that she doesn't know what it is, because she, she needs to say, hey, uh, law provider, give me a proof of non-existence for this value, right? But she doesn't know what the value is because the signature doesn't, doesn't exist. You it's didn't the capability of the, of the lock. The lock itself is a computer. It can go and check things. The lock, the lock is an entity that just, that just if, you ex if you get something, you do. Or it can also go, check, go and check the so check. the lock get some information from Alice. The log has um, the signature for the current epoch of, you know, from the uh, log provider, and that's it. It doesn't go anywhere, okay? It just gets from Alice a proof that she has access and that she hasn't been revoked, and she has the current signature, okay, from the log provider on the current epoch, okay? So I'm trying to go here through some straw men, okay, which are, which are not working, just to kind of build it up. And so, now, because the CEO has to sign a revoke statement, it's, it's no longer the case that anyone can revoke you, okay? So that, that's fixed. But there's a subtle problem. The problem is that Alice would like to give a proof of non-existence, that this value does not exist in the log. But since this value doesn't exist in the log, she doesn't know what the value is. This signature is unforgeable. Moreover, signature is also you know, randomized, so. 
why don't you just try to find the revoker and signature part and then use the signature later on? Uh, try to get proof of non-existence for the revoker and signature. Uh -huh. Later on, Vlad will check whether there's a sign with the same signature as well. Okay, but uh, the pro okay, okay. Yeah, I mean, it just so happens that you're putting the signature at the beginning, but you can just put the signature at the end, and then you can That's what that was. Saying. Okay, what would you put at the beginning? Let's work through this. signature. Okay, so you can put a revoking signature. Uh huh. But in order to prevent the denial of service attack, once the proof of existence is, is uh, uh, valid, you check that. No, but here's the thing. It's a great, great attempt. But here's here's the problem. The problem is that, and I like interactive things, but the, the problem is that, okay, so the log sees, uh, let's say someone put, someone who's mean, malicious, put revoke and signature on the. So there's no validity checks to the log? We, no. we don't, because it's a general purpose log. We didn't want to make it specific to permissions and whatnot. But it's true, if, you, if the log provider would only accept, right, revokes that are accompanied by a signature, then I agree, you could solve it. But if it's a general purpose log, then you don't. So we can fix it in a very simple way. Now, here's the way. It's actually quite simple. Cute. Uh, so the signature for the CO includes, the CO is going to flip, it's going to take a random value S. It's going to include a hash for the S into the signature. It's a secret random value, only the CO knows it, OK? When the CO wants to, um, when the CO wants to revoke Alice, it's going to put this value S, because only the CO knows S, OK? It's going to put S into the, you know, into the transparency log. Okay. So, th therefore, the operation map will contain H of S, right? Because it's sorted by the hash of S. The operation map is sorted by the hash of S. Okay. So now all that Alice has to prove to the log is that the proof of non-existence for H of S. Okay. She has to prove proof of non-existence for H of S. That's it. <coughs> Does it make sense? It's pretty simple, but it takes a few iterations to get to it. Does it make sense? OK, so the whole idea is that only. If you don't feel like, if you're worried about losing S, you could just you could use like a, like S could just be a PLS. I see, sure. Yeah, you can, it could be a hash of a deterministic signature that only the, still only the CEO would know it because it's unforgeable. I agree. So then you don't have to have the state. Yeah. 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 You can do an H. Yeah. You can implement it in. Yeah. You're assuming here a correctness constraint on the construction of the log that you said you weren't going to do. Um, okay. Can you repeat that question? Sorry. The fact that the these values in the in the second tree are hashed. Mm -hmm. at, at, at the leaves is essentially a correctness constraint <coughs> on the construction of the log. There's yes. something that the log provider is, is checking. You said you wanted to avoid that. Just the um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure I understand. No, I'm not, I'm not sure I understand the concern. Can you clarify? I think you can still add and add anything to the log. It's just, of course, you know, the, the data structure has to be correct. Yeah, you can, you can still add things to the log, but if it's not properly formed, it's going to be ignored. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it, so, but it's important here that the hash function is the same that is used. Yes, for absolutely, for the operation log. Yeah. That is the trick. That yes. Is exactly. That is the trick. That is the trick. That the hash function is the same as the hash function of the of, of the uh, uh, of the map, right? Of the operation map. Yeah. In between the CEO and Alice, there is the department head. Mm -hmm. and okay. Revoke the department. Yeah. And now I don't want Alice to go to the log because for sure, the for sure, yeah. How does for the, sure. There is no address yeah. between between so, uh, the CEO and Alice. It so, goes through. So, the, 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 the authorization is through the department. So, so remember that the proof of access is a path of signatures from the owner of the resource. Right. So, so if she gets revoked, any one of them, she won't be able to show the whole path. To the, to the log, so she won't have access. So the log looks at whole path. Yeah, I mentioned that before, yeah. 
I mentioned that. Yeah. So I think I heard another um, subtle point, which is what happens if the CEO, that person gets revoked, then how, what prevents them from actually doing revocations on Alice that are invalid? Oh, so if the CEO gets revoked, so basically let's say there's the building owner, right? And gave access to the CEO, to the, to, yeah, to the lock? Yeah, imagine some intermediates. Ah, you want, you want it in here. Yeah, so. So yeah, so there's gonna, be, there's gonna be a signature for every edge, and both edges have to be proved that have, they haven't been revoked. But you have to reissue, like as you redo your org chart, it's like if you if you chop off the top layer of your org chart, then presumably everybody needs a new manager, and so you need to like reissue a bunch of certificates, but you presumably accept that. As, as long as there's a path that's still valid, as long as there's a path that hasn't been revoked, you'll get access, right? A path from the resource owner that hasn't been revoked, you still get access. <laughs> a path that contains the, the log access. And the observation is, if you fire your CEO, yeah. you're like, every single path because he transitively authorized all your employees. So at that point, the new CEO... You need to give them access in some other way. Just a bit yeah. One is recursive, so you revoke everything on the path, or you can do non-recursive, so you can assume that the other people may be still working for the company. So you, you, you have... I mean, yeah, I mean, if you... If you Merkel tree to, to eliminate the whole subtree, sort of. No, you Oh, this is done. It's a yeah. So, so for example, if 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 you um, if, if you will revoke the CEO, and you got access from the CEO, then you lose access. Okay. Recursive. Exactly. Yes. It's recursive. It's transitive. So you it's transitive. So you lose access. You lose, lose access. But if you got access from someone else, then you're fine. All right. So this gave you a sense of the Yoldium transparency log, right? And how we basically add revocation to certificate transparency. And I have very little, a few minutes left, actually, a little bit of negative time. Um, so I'm just gonna very high level just mention what's going on here. So this is just a graph of access, right? And this HVAC controller, you know, it has access to floor three. As you can see, there's a path of floor three from the building owner. So what we want is we want to put all these permissions encrypted uh, in the transparency log, right? Because it's public, so we need to encrypt them so that people, not everyone sees them, right? But they have to be encrypted in such a way that the HVAC controller can decrypt the green arrows and cannot decrypt the red arrows. So it can only decrypt the on-path permissions that are intersecting and cannot decrypt on-path that is not intersecting. So for floor four, since it doesn't actually get access, it shouldn't be able to decrypt and also he shouldn't be able to decrypt the janitor's permissions. And anyways, there's like all kinds of strawmans. So, yeah, so I mean, at the high level, we encrypt the permissions, and each permission we include a secret that allows you to decrypt upstream permissions. Um, and there's all kinds of like strawman we could go through that are really fun, why public key encryption is insufficient. You can either decrypt, you know, way more, like even things that are floor four, you can, just not be able to decrypt things. So it's, it's really coarse, I'm not gonna go through it, but the point is that public key encryption is, is too coarse for this purpose. The reason is that the um, encryption has to take into account what the permission is, okay? So when we encrypt a permission, the key inside the encryption should depend on the app, you know, should depend on what the permission is so that it unlocks upstream permissions that are intersecting with it. Okay, and so anyways, you can look in the paper, we have a scheme that uses um, identity-based encryption and wildcard identity-based encryption that is able to narrow down the visibility of you know, every node in the system to on path and intersecting. Okay, so I'm just gonna conclude um, really fast. So we implemented Wave, it's a real system, it's open source, it's implemented in Go and C++. We deployed it as well. Uh, actually, we've op operated it for two years now. And we deployed it on over 200 IoT devices like thermostats, um, um, HVAC controllers, motion sensors. So this is the permission graph of our deployment. Um, so the thicker nodes are uh, owners of resources and the smaller nodes are um, nodes that get access. So you can see the edges are just permissions. So that's been really fun, you know, working with a real system, operating it for you know, two years and we learned a lot. So in terms of performance, I'm just gonna brush really fast through. Um, the graph changing operations are on the order of milliseconds, which we think by, you know, what you can notice from a UI standpoint, it's, it's, you know, it's fast. And, you know, this is a graph of showing how long it takes to, you know, to build a proof, uh, you know, again, on the order of tens of milliseconds and to verify it. 
Uh, and the, at least in our deployment, the average proof length so was, a four, was four. So there are four delegations was the average proof length. Okay, so in conclusion, WAVE is a decentralized authorization system. Yeah. Change the IoT device to check these? Uh, very, very, very good, very good point, very good point. So many uh, IoT devices, so in, in many cases we have agents, we call them WAVE agents. I didn't there's a whole, you know, this system has a lot of systems building behind it, what, beyond what I explained. And many of these devices work with agents, so they just have a secure communication to an agent, and the agent is able to implement things like WAVE. So in that case, you don't change IoT device in that case. In cases like Raspberry Pis, then it's easier to change it. So you are putting your, your protocol on, let's say, Samsung Hub or whatever? Yes, yes. It's, it's very common in IoT, yeah. What did geographical uh, uh, it's 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 uh, universities and campuses in California, so it's mostly California. Yeah, twenty buildings across different UC campuses. To health or so we have a bunch of scalability, you know, experiments in, in in the paper, and yes, the hope is to scale like certificate transparency to to the whole globe. I'm not going to make a s statement that we do necessarily do that, but. That's that's the hope, and you know, and a lot of the overheads are just logarithmic, so you know it, it should be that way. Okay, and we have some uh, emulations and simulations for larger scale, uh, but I'm not going to just say this scales to the globe. Okay, I can't just say that. But that's the that's the hope, right? That's the intention with the design. Okay. So WAVE is a decentralized authorization system that uses cryptographically enforced graph of authorization, stores the graph in a new transparency log ULDM, and encrypts attestations uh, to hide the graph um, instead of just using an access control server that's trusted to store all permissions. And you know the hope to, with this is to replace traditional authorization systems. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for the interaction. It was a lot of fun. So now it's lunch. Should we zoom on the state of time? Uh, at yeah, two o'clock.